Okay. Good morning. Well, we're going to need to, all the time we've got this morning. So uh, let's open up with a word of prayer. Father, as we come to you today talking, uh, set in a very important subject on your heart and just pray that uh, you'll help us to uh, to study your word and see what you have to say about raising children and and Lord we we thank you for those precious gifts you've given to us and pray that you'll help us to be more responsible and uh, assisting with their development and their maturing um, as parents and grandparents now and great grandparents thank you so much in Jesus name Amen. If you have uh, an outline today, you see I've got a most ambitious um, thing, and I need my clicker. Hold on a second. Okay. Training children in a topsy-turvy world. The verse we're going to look at mostly is Proverbs 22, verse 6. Anybody know what that verse says? Train up a child. That's right. And we'll look at it more closely. There is a, a lot of turbulence in our, our time. And there... Uh, part of the problem that we uh, that sociologists and psychologists are, are looking at is the lack of parenting, especially by fathers. Uh, there's been a dramatic increase in violence, drug problems, pregnancy, abortion, homelessness, homelessness incarceration. And this is uh, a staggering chart on the left hand side. You see these different issues as it relates to those that are fatherless. Versus those who had a, a meaningful relationship with the father uh, in their lives. 70, uh, approximately 70, 72% of all of these categories, uh, violence, drug abuse, murder, poverty, and high school dropout rates are from those that are fatherless. Look at that. That is a staggering uh, understanding of what's what's happening in our culture and if this wasn't on parenting i i could easily have chosen the subject fathering because when you look in the scriptures who does god lay the responsibility chief responsibility for the raising of the children by uh, taking care of the family it's on the the father and it's good to see you uh, fathers represented here this morning. There are 18 million fatherless children in the United States. That is one out of every four children you meet will not have a meaningful relationship with a father. This is the highest rate in the world. The highest. Other studies have revealed that even in the homes when the dad isn't present, he's largely absent in the child's life. The average school child spends only about 30 minutes in meaningful conversation with his dad in a week's time. 30 minutes. That's like less than five minutes a day. In addition to, uh, to that, we find that there are a number of things that are going on uh, across the country, there's a father in California who was real upset about the instruction his daughter was receiving in elementary school. Uh, he contacted uh, 
people about it and it essentially did nothing. Uh, mother in Oregon and her in the first grade, they had Zumba classes and uh, there was uh, terrible music and she made it known what was happening and nobody said anything. Um, there was a lady uh, in Fairfax County in Virginia appeared on America's newsroom and she made this statement says, these children are the future of this country, and if you love this country, you will do anything and everything to stand up for the vulnerable population that is our children. They cannot stand up for themselves. They cannot speak for themselves. They fear retaliation. So up, it's up to us adults, parents, and teachers alike to come together and speak up for them for the sake of this country. In recent years, parents have been awakened to the gravity of the problem. Parents have been horrified by the videos and books that have been shown to their precious five- and six-year-olds. Many parents are beginning to stand up to the school boards and speak out for their children, and for that, they're being labeled as domestic terrorists. Now, I was a public school teacher. I was also in a private school before that, and I don't mean to paint with too large a brush because there are well many well-meaning and godly teachers across our country. But in many places across our nation, the education system has been and is controlled by the liberal left. If you think of making this up, just, you know, uh, and exaggerating this, look at some of the uh, school texts that, uh, that your children are using. For instance, the biology textbook I used mentioned that Louis Pasteur disproved, scientifically disproved, spontaneous generation. It means that life didn't come from non-living things. But you flip a few pages, and there it is through the rest of the book, spontaneous generation is affirmed over and over and over again. Um, Ronald Reagan made the comment, this freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it to our children in the bloodstream. It must be fought for, protected, and handed on for them to do the same. Or one day we will spend our sunset years telling our children and our children's children what it was once like in the United States where men were free. Adolf Hitler said, let me control the textbooks. And I will control the state. And he did. Have you ever heard of the Janissaries? The Janissaries, if you look here, this kind of looks medieval, and it, and it was. Uh, this is a select group of young men that were kidnapped from European towns when the, the Turks same as the Muslims today, when the Turks invaded or when they were at war with the Europeans, and they would kidnap their children, take them back, and train them rigorously for the next 10 years or so. And then they would put them into the forefront of the battle against their own families. They were called Janissaries. They had a distinctive appearance. They even had uh, distinctive music. And back in the 1700s, 1800s, uh, Bach, Beethoven, Mozart, all of these different ones were influenced by their music. And they, were, they had a distinctive ferocity in battle, and they were fiercely loyal to their sultan. So when they're fighting against their own families, against their own parents, the parents didn't stand a chance because they were able to recognize who they were fighting against, or at least, you know, because some people believe that they had a distinctive European look, whether it was long blonde hair or, you know, whatever it was at, at the time. Uh, Ray Steadman wrote, I have been in homes where there's no testimony to God or recognition of him at all. Yet they have been orderly homes, moral homes, loving homes, joy to be, to be in, and where the children are obviously well-adjusted and able to cope with life. So some people say, what difference then does Christianity add? The answer is that if you investigate a home like this, you will find that just a generation or so back, there has been a significant Christian exposure somewhere in that family. 
In other words, secular homes of that character are living on the capital of faith, which has been invested by a previous generation. Now, that's what our nation has been doing, living off of the, the benefits and the uh, successes of past generations. We've been living on the spiritual bank account of our forefathers. But now the resources upon which we as a people have been drawing are gone. They're empty. And so the, the importance of bringing up these Janissaries is that for several hundred years, the Janissaries were a fighting force. Think of the uh, Army Rangers or the Navy SEALs, your, your top uh, forces. That's what these people were. They transformed off, they transformed or cast off their, their beliefs and their loyalties to the Christian families, just like it was an old coat. Now, I bring this up because I believe that this is part of the playbook of uh, Satan. And that he is trying to take, and he, in large part in this country, he has been very successful, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, 70% of our youth that uh, do not have a significant father experience in their life are creating havoc and turbulence and turmoil in our country. Satan loves to roar. What happens when you hear a roar? Last night, there was a sudden uh, clap of thunder. And I mean, it, it, it must have hit something just outside, you know, within a hundred yards or so of our house. Uh, and, but what happens when you hear that roar, when you hear that sudden thunderbolt? What? Yes, it's, it scares you. And that's what the intention is, to scare us. Um, he wants to scare you and me out of our wits so that we're unable to resist his attacks. Lions also cry out to declare their territory off bounds to others. Satan resists any encroachments into his territory. For centuries, he has held on to the lands that we consider mission fields. But presently, he's fought against those, and now he is attacking the capitals in our country. And every day, he declares more and more country. Yes, we are concerned about the kidnapping of our children and the human trafficking crisis around the world. It is truly a serious situation, but there's probably a bigger danger of which we aren't even aware. I'm speaking of the kidnapping of our children's minds every day and the education process through the media, technology, uh, liberal uh, schools, filling their minds with humanism, evolution, and new age ideas that contradict biblical doctrines. So what do we do? Parents should train up their children, according to Proverbs 22, 6. And the way that they should go when they're old, they will not depart from it. Well, let's examine this just a minute. Dr. Paul Vitz, a professor at New York University, said, One of the major characteristics of moral decline in the United States in recent decades has been the rapid growth of moral relativism. Anybody know what that means? Moral relativism. Situational ethics. What does that mean? What? Okay. What's right for you may not be necessarily right for me. It's, it's the belief that there is no absolute truth, no absolute morals. And we'll talk about that again in a minute. The idea is now widespread that each individual has some kind of sovereign right to create, develop, and exercise whatever values he or she happens to prefer. Ephesians 6, 1 through 4, gives instruction to parents. It says, Children, obey your parents and Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. Now, I want to back up just a minute and touch some ground that we've looked at before, but I want to do it in a way to show you how this fits in with raising of children. In Ephesians, Paul sets a table for what a Christian home looks like. In Ephesians 5, he describes the husband and wife relationship. 
And he specifically begins in verse 21 in chapter 5, where he says that believers are to be submissive one to another. And he doesn't specify. He's, it's all Christians are to be in a uh, submissive state to each other. Now, why? In Philippians 2, Paul says that we are to put on the mind of Christ. And he says that, that Christ looked at himself and he valued others more important than, than himself. And so it's with that mindset that he begins to give a directive to women. Now, when Jesus said, be submissive to one another, the disciples should have pictured the idea of Jesus kneeling on the floor and doing what? Washing their feet, okay, as a humble servant. Um, are we better than our Lord who humbled himself in that manner? No, definitely not. Now, Paul then directs wives to submit themselves to their husbands. As the church is subject to Christ, so the woman is to be subject to her husband. In verse 24, it says, in everything. Now, this doesn't imply that the husband is always right. Is that true? No, nobody will say. Okay. Okay, that's true. Okay. What it does mean, now listen, this is important for you to understand, that the husband is responsible for all the decisions or non-decisions that are made in that house. In his household, God holds him responsible. So when she is submissive to him, then who's there to blame except for him? Um, nor does it mean that she should be submissive to illegal or godless behavior. In every relationship, we have our relationship with God as our priority. And that doesn't change because of marriage. Now, what Paul does in, in uh, Ephesians chapter 5 is masterful. He speaks to the woman about submitting to her husband, and then he addresses the man. The, the first bombshell was be submitted to one another. The second one is that he is to do what? What does God tell the husband to do? To love his wife as Christ loved the church, sacrificed himself and given himself up for the church. The, the husband in those day and times was the king of his castle. Any member of his family was his property. And what do you do with property? You use it, dispose of it as you please. And that's what they did. So he would have welcomed Paul's directives for his wife. But when he heard what Paul say, said to him, uh, he had to be thinking, hold your horses, Paul. You've lost your senses. How can you say that? Um, and he's, he's supposed to be sanctifying, setting her apart for a special purpose, and cleansing her and perfecting her. He, he's, he's got to be scratching his head, wondering, where are you going with this, Paul? And the, the picture is that the husband is to set his wife apart for special treatment. That's why Deuteronomy 24, it didn't change. In Deuteronomy 24, it talks about the husband taking a year off from the battle, taking a year off from business affairs to cheer up his wife, to love his wife, and to teach her and honor her. She's given up her former security, independence, and direction to become his helpmate. His job is to love his wife by studying her and working towards helping her to grow and mature as a person and child of God. And then the coup d'etat uh, he gives is to, you know, if that isn't plain enough for you men, it isn't simple enough for you, then look at your bodies, look in the mirror. You're to treat your wife as you do your own body. And so he brought it down to the, you know, where they could understand it. He says the way you care for yourself is the way you should be treating your wife. And then he goes on and talks about this as a relationship between Christ and the church, a picture of that. Um, they're to be joined in mutual submission, being of one mind and one body. And in light of that, 
It's saying the man should be placing his wife on a pedestal. Any ladies feel like you've been on a pedestal? Though they were to reverence and subject themselves to the husband, it's as though the king of the castle is bent down and is washing her feet. And that's what Christ did. In Ephesians 6, now notice he starts also again here with the ones who are under authority. He starts with the children. He says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. So these are the commands given to the children. Since no children here, I'm not going to belabor those issues, but we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. And then he looks at the father and says, You fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Any of you have a garden or had a garden? Do you know what nurturing means with a garden? What, what does it mean to nurture something? To take care of it, feed it, talk to it, pet it, you know, what, whatever it takes. Prune it. There you go. Uh, it's sometimes a little hard. Uh, we'll, we'll get to pruning a little later. Uh, but I, before we discuss Proverbs 22, 6 very much, I want to help you to understand the difference between a proverb and a promise of God. Proverbs are general truths, are principles that are based on observation. If you do this, this is the normal result. God's character and reputation are not on the line. But if he makes a promise, he's saying, if you do this, I will do this. And sometimes he makes unilateral promises unconditionally, says, I will do this anyway. So that's, that's a promise, but that's different. Now, when you look through the book of Proverbs, they are basic truths that apply across life. And a wise uh, parent will take their, their sons and their daughters and they will teach them these, these principles in the scripture. Uh, what's one dealing with uh, friendships? Uh, what's the one about the feathers? Uh, okay, Proverbs 17, 17. Uh, as a man sharpeneth, that's talking about sharpening. Uh, the countenance of his brother. Um, but it, one that's not in the scripture, the friends, uh, uh, how does that go with the, the flock? I uh, can't think about the birds of a feather flock together. Now, that's a general principle that, that you do see in the, in the scriptures. Uh, you do see in Proverbs. Um, uh, you might say, if you stick your finger in a saw, you're going to feel some pain. Uh, I, a few of us have had that experience. Um, it's generally a true statement. Now, another true statement would be when you turn the switch on, the light's going to come on. Or when you, uh, I, a few minutes ago, they were trying to get the sound system working for the Baptist, for the baptistry. And they're tapping and everything, but you've got to plug it up first. So generally, it's going to work. But if the source of power has been interrupted, then, you know, the adage, the proverb isn't true anymore, at least for that particular instance, until the power is returned to it. So that's the difference between a proverb and a promise. Also, in Scripture, this is uh, Genesis 1, 27, 28. God gave mankind, humankind, gave people the precept to multiply. And this is a picture of one of our trips to India. Uh, it says, be fruitful and multiply. You know, govern the earth. Um, God created man and woman for the purpose of multiplying his image across the earth. To produce a godly seed. And he says it in, in as much in Malachi chapter 2, verses 14 through 16. Uh, why did he do all this? He says he seeks a godly offspring. Uh, and therefore take heed to your spirit, let none deal treacherously with the wife of his youth, for the Lord God of Israel says that he hates divorce, for it covers one's garment with violence. And then in, uh, uh, before we get to that, 
You know, it was God's idea for man and woman to produce a godly seed. God desired to populate the earth with his likeness. As a side note, but very important, look at that last phrase there. That the idea is that the best example a man can set for his children is to be loyal and loving of his wife. Best thing you could show to your children is your love for your wife. Malachi chapter 4, verses 4 through 6, uh, he predicts that he's going to send someone to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, the hearts of the children of their fathers. And we see that was fulfilled when John the Baptist came and the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, to make a people prepare for the Lord. There's a revival in the day when John the Baptist uh, began his ministry. Parenting. Proverbs 1, 7-9 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. My son, hear the instruction of your father and do not forsake the law of your mother, for they will be a graceful ornament on your head and chains about your neck. Now, this is a, a little-known proverb in chapter 30, verse 17. It says, The eye that mocks his father and despises obedience to his mother is inviting the ravens of the valley to pluck his eye out for the baby birds to devour. I'll explain that in a second. What a person who was mocking or disrespecting his parents is doing is saying to the world, I am dead to the ways of my parents. I am open to your interference in my life. I'm dead to their ways. I'm dead to their righteousness. I am dead to whatever they represent. I'm open bait. Now, what happens when a, a bird, uh, like these vultures around here, do when they see a dead animal on the side of the road? What's well, one of the first things they do? They, they buzz around and everything until they think the coast is clear, and they go down and they land. And the first thing they do is to peck at the what? The eye. They peck at the eye of the animal because they know if it doesn't protect its eye, then it's dead. And parents are the light of God for their children as they're maturing and as they're being trained. So it's saying disrespect and mocking is tantamount to declaring one is dead to his parents' guidance. Some practical advice for parents. Parents should train up their children in the way. <clears throat> the worldview is the lens through which each individual learns to understand God, the world, himself, and how they relate to each other. <clears throat> and I want to look at it. I developed this acronym, Growing a Worldview. Recognize individual the child's worth, help them to own worthy convictions, and help them to work out. The, Paul talks about working out your salvation, but working out and submitting our will to God. But to do that, we need to understand that there are essentially four main worldviews that we come across. Uh, secular humanism. <clears throat> this is everything got here by purely natural processes, evolution. Uh, again, we're talking about moral relativity. You pull yourself up by your bootstraps. You can do it. Science can explain everything. There is no God. Charles Darwin was one of the ones that proffered this idea. Second is Marxism and Leninism. They took it a little bit further, and they began to apply it across society, developing socialism, uh, basically classless, materialist, revolutionary. And it's a punctuated equilibrium or punctuated evolution. That's the idea that change happened very suddenly. That's why they're behind revolution. We can't wait like Darwin did for millions of years to see things to happen. We've got to get things happening right away. Lenin made this statement, give me four years to teach the children and the seed I have sown will never be 
uprooted. What a statement. Cosmic humanism or the new age. Again, evolution. This time there's reincarnation. But this is kind of the opposite of the humanism in that when they say there is no God, they're saying everything is God. Now, which is worse? They're both equally bad. All is God or becoming God. One day you will be God if you are God yet. Uh, and again, truth is relative. So all of the, these three, it has to do with a relative uh, moral society. Biblical Christianity, you can see the difference right away. Creation is by God and is directed by Him. In the beginning, it says, God created the heavens and the earth. Let us make man in our own image. His word is absolute truth, unchanging, immutable. I'll skip this. Now, contained in a list of tribes who came to Hebron to turn the kingdom of Saul over to David, we find something very unique in this, in this passage. This is in 1 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32. It says, Of the children of Isaacar, which were men that had understanding of the times, to know what Israel ought to do, says that there were 200 of them. And it says, and their brothers listened to them. So he had 200 men. Well, that's, a, you know, that's a lot in one particular tribe. But it speaks of the uh, quality we won't have in our children, that they will understand the times. And we need to understand the times that we're living in. So... Growing a worldview, that's the uh, first concept we're looking at. And part of that has to do with recognizing boundaries. Um, have you ever worked on a puzzle? I was going to bring a puzzle in a box lid to show you. And you pull this out and it's got a thousand pieces. And you, I'll never be able to put this thing together. And you, what's the first thing you start with? At least I do. The outside that's the easiest part because you at least got common. You can say, well, all these, you know, they have a flat side and we can eventually get them together. And then as you begin to do it and you begin to fill it in, you know, you, you have pieces that look so much like each other. And sometimes the whole puzzle, almost every piece is exactly the same. I don't know how they get together. But uh, anyway, you what do you need to put the puzzle together? What would be really helpful is... The box lid. The box lid. Now, and keep referring back to the box lid. Now, what is the box lid for our children? It's, we need, what's that? A model. They need to be able to see what the picture is going to look like. And so many sons are missing out on the image of what a dad looks like. My dad's dad died when he was a kid, so he didn't have a father. And my dad, when I grew up, was in Vietnam or in Okinawa or somewhere like that much of the early part of my life. And when we were growing up for the, you know, up until after he retired from the Army, and I was in high school, uh, he didn't attend church with us. And so... I'm in high school and he's starting to attend and everything and beginning to see some things. Now, I go back to what we we're talking about earlier, the bank uh, of former generations. My dad taught me a lot of things, a lot of moral things. But I didn't see the connection between them and the scriptures and principles in the scripture until later when I began to see them myself. And that's one thing that we need to, to understand now. We need to give our children that box stop, give them that model so they can understand what we're going to talk about in a few minutes, who they are and, and where they're going. Um, but God has given us boundaries. Now, boundaries are given to protect us. What was the first boundary given Adam and Eve? That's right. It was a protection. It was a protection to keep them from the knowledge of good and evil. Because the only way they could gain that knowledge was to 
experience it. So God gave us boundaries to protect us. And, you know, except for Christ who lived and matured as man, every person experiences what God can never experience or undergo. Change. You ever think about that? God can't experience change. He's changeless. And what we fail to realize is that positive change is only possible when there is an absolute to gauge that change. And so we were born with a sin nature. But God has given us certain things in the, in the scriptures to guide us and to lead us along the way. But look at the second. Boundaries can be removed. When Christ was on the cross, when Christ died, what did God do? He reached down and, and tore, ripped, shredded the, the veil of the temple so that now man could have access to the throne of God without having to go through an earthly high priest. And not only that, but it also allowed the entrance of the Holy Spirit into a believer's life, into a person, to guide us and direct us. But what has uh, happened with our, you know, our enemies, Satan, they blur the boundaries. Are we surprised today that evolutionary teaching blur the lines between men and animals? They teach that man is no more important, sometimes less important than other species. Some regard man as nothing more than a blight or contagion on the world. We'd be better off if uh, a good segment of them died. Only the elite deserve a place. God's word declares that man, each man, is a pinnacle of his creation and is of immense worth. It's also worth noting that in Genesis 1, we're told that God created man. He created, when he created them, he created them male and female. Our society has become so progressive, we disregard God's word, biological science, moral absolutes, and seek to shame and sue those who are not so liberated. Boundaries are bypassed. Um, Proverbs 25, 28 says, He who has no rule over his own spirit is like a city broken down and without walls. Anybody remember what happened to ancient Babylon? And they were celebrating in the temple, uh, not the temple, but in their feast hall. And they saw handwriting on the wall. Many, many tickle you farce. And basically, you've been weighed in the balance and God has found you wanting. You're lightweight. And the Persians are going to come in. And what they do while they were pardoned, the Persians were uh, sneaking in through the, uh, under the, the gates. Now, there's a, a similar story happened in the legends of Troy. Everybody knows what happened with a giant horse. That was left outside, and the uh, Trojans thought, well, you know, this is a gift, or they left the leftover. So they rolled it into the city, and at night, Odysseus and his men climbed out and ransacked the city. Now, that's Satan's strategy with us. Lures are designed like the Trojan horse to, to take in. They, they're innocent sometimes. They create curiosity, wonder, and attractive uh, attraction. And when it, it appeals to a desire that's already in our heart, then the attacks from outside and inside meet together. And will seek to destroy us. There is uh, Belshazzar reading the Judgment on the wall. Phylacteries. If you look in Deuteronomy chapter 6, we don't have time to look at that uh, in detail, but he talks about the parents raising up their children and teaching them along the way. And he talks about writing them on, the, on your forehead and on your uh, forearms and on the pillars and places in, in your house. Now, they didn't mean for us to literally do this. No, it, the idea is that 
His word is going to be so saturated in our minds that it's going to guide our hands. It's going to guide our thoughts, our minds, our speech, our feet as we walk. So that, you know, Jesus said to uh, uh, the Pharisees, says, all therefore whatsoever they observe you, do it. They've, they've got a good textbook. But the problem is they're not following it themselves. It says you need to walk the talk. Saturate yourself with God's word and then obey it. And Deuteronomy uh, 6 says, The Lord our God is one Lord. You should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. But the boundaries. This is in your outline, and I didn't expect you to read this up here, but I provided it for you. Uh, we need to teach our children that God is the one that created this universe. And in an early age, he or she needs to hear how that he is the sustainer. He is the creator. And about God's son coming and sacrificing himself. for the, And also about the indwelling of the spirit. Second Chronicles 16.9 says, For the, the Lord is, the eyes of the Lord are running to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of them whose heart is loyal or perfect toward him. The Lord is looking for a few good men and women. Uh, and why this makes a difference is that each child needs to see that everything we do, everything we say, should be governed by this lens of pleasing him. And also about how he prepares and empowers us. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 9 through 16 is a wonderful uh, section dealing with all the things that God has prepared for, uh, for us, all the things that, that we need in life. And he says he's even given us the mind of Christ to make our decisions. And the question is, why does God bother with people? He created us to love and to do good works. Look in Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. He enjoys fellowship with us and he wants us to live and he provides for us to have a full and meaningful life. Now, application. What can you do with your children, read the scripture to them, sing songs that have scripture, and then teach them the songs, uh, explain nature to them as you encounter. When you see something strange outside, and it happens every day, my daughters are always sending me pictures of critters that they're finding and ask me what they are and, uh, and stuff. And uh, we can teach our children to have a sense of compassion and curb their tendencies to kill things. Little bunnies or frogs or whatever. Teach them to appreciate beauty and order. Train up a child in the way she should go. By recognizing their worth. They're created and designed by God. They were called by God. And Jesus said, let the little children come into me. You know, you come to me as a, as a humble child. And they are God's plan for a godly world. And we're to cherish each of them according to their design. Um, who am I? Psalm 139. Why am I here? What does he expect of us? I, Timothy, as a young man, was taught the scriptures by his mother and grandmother. Um, and the scriptures brought him wisdom, faith, and training and right living to bring God glory. And what is... You know, what is the child's vision? Help them become fruitful, become wise and mature. I, even as I said of Jesus, Luke 2, 52, so he's increased in wisdom and in, fa and in favor with God and man. And who is on my team? You have the Father, the Son, the truth, or that's uh, the Word of God. Uh, you have the Spirit. Parents, Christian brothers and sisters who are seeking to please God and who are my friends. And uh, we have these, these questions. Sometimes we're puzzled uh, by them. And I have a, a short thing here about false friends and faithful friends. If you go through the book of Proverbs, you'll find many things about if you follow after this, this group of people, this is where it's going to lead you. And on the left-hand side, false friends are going to lead you to violence. They're going to lead you to trouble and destruction and to be in want. 
where faithful friends are going to help you to be wiser. And they're going to stick by you in good and in bad times. This scripture is going to help you with making decisions such as going to school, who be your friends, sport, hobby, interest, career you pursue, and even who you should marry. Now, gray areas in life affect everybody. I, but the choice is, does, does my choice honor and glorify God? Is it hurting others? Or does it enhance my testimony or draw me and others closer to God? What about being a missionary in Alaska? This is a picture that I took in Alaska. I've made it into a puzzle, at least on the screen. Um, but uh, in searching for God's uh, will regarding something, you know, you have a concern. Do you feel a calling? Uh, obeying God's word. Are you gifted in this particular area? Uh, have you prayed about it? Other people praying for you. Do you have peace? You have counsel of your parents and other leaders, people that know you. The next section deals with owning convictions that will guide you. I want, I, I want to back up just a second. Um, something I didn't cover earlier. In Proverbs 22, 6, it's train up in a, chi a child in the way he should go. That word train is a Hebrew word for dedicate. And it, it's used uh, four other times in the, uh, in the Old Testament, meaning to like dedicating a house or something for a particular purpose. Now, the, the picture is that God has given us children as gifts that we are responsible for. And so we dedicate ourselves to raising them for His glory. They, we are stewards in that relationship. But it also says in the way they should go. The idea here is also that children are individuals and they have their, their own bent. Train up a child according to his own bent. Not the way, you know, how many times have you seen people raise their children and say, well, he's going to do this, he's going to be this, and he's going to follow in my footsteps and take over the business. And that may not be that child's aspiration at all. It's saying, study your child, get to know who your child is, what his gifts, his strengths, his, his aspirations are, and then help them to fulfill God's will for them in their lives. And so we get to this section here, owning convictions that will guide them. Because as we develop convictions, there are going to be consequences that are going to come ahead. Notice on the left-hand side, i got a bigger arrow there. If you have convictions settled in your own heart and guiding you, when the consequences occur, they're not going to be overwhelming. And in fact, 1 Corinthians 10, verse uh, 13, says that when we encounter trials and temptations, there's always a way out of escape that God has prepared for us. What are the consequences of following God? There are good consequences. We're going to have reward, fruits of the Spirit, fellowship, victory, strength, blessing, these sorts of things. But there are also some bad things that are going to happen. There's going to be persecution and hatred from the world. Jesus said, if they've hated me, what do you think they're going to do to you? You're not going to escape the bullet just because I took one. And what or who opposes me that brings it up? So we need to teach children about the state of existence of our uh, the forces that are against us. We are in a battle. And it isn't always a visible battle. Sometimes it is, but a lot of times there are sneaky strategies by Satan behind the scene. They include Satan, demons, the world, those under his sway, who are so-called friends, who are leading us in the wrong way, and even ourselves, our sin nature. The powers of darkness are mighty, but they're not the antithesis of God. They are not the, uh, the equal to God in the, in the negative world and darkness. They're limited, and they can be resisted. James 4, verse 7. Not only that, but Christians have been given armor for protection, the belt of truth, breastplate of righteousness, shoes of peace, shield of faith, helmet of salvation. That's something you could do with your child. I pictured... 
uh, daddy getting dressed up as a, as a soldier or something and showing what are these different parts of the armor are for. But Christians also have the most powerful weapon. Actually, kind of twofold. It's the Word of God and the spoken Word of God. Now, the, we, in uh, John chapter 1 and all through the book of John, it talks about Jesus being the Logos. He's the active, living, personal Word of God. But in uh, the Scriptures in Ephesians 6, it's a different word. It's rhema. This is the spoken word of God. When Jesus was tempted, what did he do? He spoke the word of God from the book of Deuteronomy. And Paul gets a lot of his teaching from Deuteronomy. And we know he gets... Uh, but though victory has already been won, we're still going to encounter battles here. And Paul says... If you are living a life that's pleasing to God, you can expect tribulation. All that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So what are the consequences if you follow Satan, self, the world, sin, death, broken fellowship with God and others? You're going to have feelings of shame, guilt, uselessness, loneliness, hopelessness. And what can we do? When failure occurs. Now, Scripture, I'd say I put chastisement here first because sometimes we're not aware of what's happening and, and where we've gone wrong. And so God will put a barrier in front of us or something, some sort of consequence to slow us down, to stop us and make us see wherein we have erred. And But there's some principles here. Sin does not change our position or our destination. It changes our relationship and our fellowship, our peace and joy. And not only that, I, I get some of these uh, ideas from, uh, from people in Life Group and other places. Um, and one, uh, a couple of people said something about learning and growing from your sins. Parents must be careful not to insulate their children so that they never fall or fail, being like helicopter parents, keeping them up. Every time they get ready to fall, they slide and catch them before they, they can skin their knees or whatever. That's part of the learning process. But we must be careful to go on from there. God is glorified when they are restored. God is sovereign over all failures, sins, and afflictions. Chastisement or discipline all through the book of Proverbs, as well in Hebrews chapter 12, is a sign of love, not hate. In fact, if you don't discipline your child, you don't chastise them at times, they will think that you don't care for them. You don't love them. I heard about this one girl who was dressed in the most scandalous uh, uh, outfits and her dad just you know, would tell her bye. And, and when they got to where they're going, the girl would go into the restroom and change into more uh, moderate clothes and everything. And she tried to get his attention, trying to get him to tell her no. She wanted boundaries. And that's the thing we don't realize that even though our, ch our children are resisting us, and they will fight full bear against something that, you know, we think they want. Sometimes they don't want it. They want to be able to tell their friends, oh, I, w I would like to do this with you, but they won't let me. You know, they want that protection that you provide. And I give you a process of uh, correction you can do here. And uh, we don't really have time to go over all of this, but develop this plan it, you know, as the child grows, then you can develop in concert with them and say, well, you know, what do you think is appropriate if you do this? Uh, and, and, you know, just work with them on that. Be sure the transgression, ask questions of need. Keep communication open with your children. Sometimes you don't always see what you see. Your eyes can be deceiving. And I know sometimes you see what you think what you want to see or what, you know, what you've been led to see. But open lines of communication and find out what really did happen. You might have misunderstood what was said or done. And the older I get, the more I hear things I didn't hear. <laughs> My mind takes and interprets it and, and changes it around from something that was actually said. Then remind the child of the consequences. Reassure them of your love and God's love 
administer discipline, not locking up in a doghouse like this lady did recently. Now, uh, she's going to prison for nine years, I think it is. Uh, starving them, rejecting them. Correction and growth, not scars, is the intended result. There can be redirection, removal of some valued object for a time, quiet time, different things. But stress your acceptance of the child with a hug. Parents should train up their children the way they should go. And when the child is old, well, we need to, to work out. Uh, Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 24 through 27 says that, you know, I, I'm working out, I'm in a boxing match, and, you know, only one person's going to, you know, come out the winner and says, everybody who is uh, athletic, they're competing in this race. And only one's going to receive the prize. He says, I therefore so fight, not as uncertainly. So they're doing it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. And he says that, you know, I'm not one who's beating the air. He said, but I am keeping under my body and bringing it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. And I look on the, the scene and look in the world today. There are pastors and godly men and women across the, the world who are castaways. Paul lists some in the uh, book of 2 Timothy. Each chapter, there are two individuals in there. Janus and Jambres, they withstood Moses. And um, you had Demas, uh, who had loved this present world, forsaking God, and departed after, I guess, the, the things of this world. But we need to help them to develop discipline, commitment in their lives. And this is where we get back to what we're talking about, modeling an example through patience, repetition, and love, are directing them along the path after you. Years ago, I, I well, a couple years ago, I read a terrible story that happened many years ago that Nightingale is uh, valued for its beautiful repertoire of songs, over 900 and some different uh, uh, different sounds. And so these entrepreneurs got together and say, hey, you know, I, we could really make a fortune off of these birds, but the problem is they don't sing when we want them to. You know, you can't talk to them and say, Polly won a cracker, and it repeats, Polly won the cracker. Uh, so they experimented. They put hoods over the bird's head to make it sing. And because it, when singing, it was mostly at night or in the early dawn mornings, uh, dawn of the morning, in courting. And so they wanted to sing all the time. Well, the bird wouldn't naturally do that. So they came upon this. They injected a needle into its eye to blind it. And then they would set one bird against another bird, two males, and, and another a female nearby or something. And they will vie against each other sometimes to the death. And people are betting against them. Now, this was outlawed about 1905. This was happening in uh, Coventry Gardens in England and other places in, in Europe back in the 17 and 1800s. Satan argues, I'm only making a little music here. The music of these birds thrills and encourages so many people. The ends justify the means. And that's what he's trying to do with our children. He claims them for his own. They belong to the state. They don't belong to me and you. It's their responsibility to do what they want with it. But scriptures tell us that parents should train up their children the way they should go. And when the child is old, he will not depart from it. Again, that's a proverb. Um, I want to read this quote. This was written in 1828. The great object was to get rid of Christianity and to convert our churches into halls of science. The plan was not to make open attacks upon religion, although we might belabor the clergy and bring them into contempt where we could, but to establish a system of state national schools from which all religion was to be excluded. The plan has been successfully pursued and the whole action of the country on the subject has taken the direction we sought to give it. Can you believe that was written in 1828? If I didn't put that date up there, you could have believed that it was written yesterday. So, GROW. That's the acronym I have for you. 
uh, help your children to grow their own world view, which is scriptural. Help them to recognize, realize who they are in God and what his plan is for them. O is to own their convictions. That's something that will stand them true when they're not around you. And W pertains to walking or working out that commitment in life. Now, I want to uh, close with this Ten Commandments for Training Your Child. And these, came, these are several ideas that uh, different parents gave to me. Listen, observe the bent of your child. Know what he is about. Show, don't merely tell. Model character and integrity. Allow for failure, but learn from it. Teach perseverance. Forgive and ask forgiveness. Confess when you are wrong. Pray for and with your child. Provide and protect. Teach along the way. Keep open communication. There can be no quality time without quantity time. Spend time with your child. Serve and submit to God and each other. Love God, your spouse, your child, always. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your word. And Lord, we, we pray that you'll help us to just get into the arena where our children are battling. Help us, Lord, to show them the way. Help us to model the way of obedience to Christ. Help us to model love for one another. And Lord, yes, even help us to humble ourselves so that we will serve them. And Lord, I speak for the men today. Pray that you will teach us to honor and love and care for and sanctify our wives as Christ did the church. Teach us to respond as you would have us to do. Lord, Paul called himself a bondservant. Lord, we're fellow servants, fellow slaves to righteousness. Help us to show the world who Christ is. Help us to hold up the light that shines in our lives so that others may see and turn to you. In Jesus' name, amen.